This is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I'm your host, Davey Crockett. Thanks. Thanks for coming. This is episode 35. In this episode, I will tell the story of the greatest American ultra runner of the early 1980s, Bernd Heinrich, the Birdman of ultra running. During the first half of the 1980s, Bernd Heinrich of Vermont was the fastest ultra runner in America. Today few know of him and his amazing running records and accomplishments. Heinrich is the birdman and bee man of ultra running. He also was unique from most other ultra runners in that rather than competing in many races, he was very selective in his race choices. When he ran, he had specific goals to win or set records with laser-focused training for these very few specific events. Using this approach, he was able to win and set several American and world records. Heinrich appeared suddenly on the ultra-running scene, setting a record in his very first ultra, and he quickly rose to the top of the sport. He was named Ultra Runner of the Year three of the first four years of Ultra Running Magazine. In his life priorities, running was secondary to his true love, observing, researching, teaching, and writing about nature. During his intense running years, he was able to find balance to become a world-renowned expert in his professional naturalist career. Baron Heinrich was born in Poland in 1940. Near the end of World War II, he and his family fled their large farm near Gdansk to escape advancing Russian troops in 1944 and crossed what would be the future border for East Germany. Heinrich recalled, The times were not easy. The biggest problem was filling our bellies. Papa decided that the best chance of finding food would be the forest. We came across a large reserve called the Hanhide, and within it was a small empty hut used before the war by a nature club from Hamburg. The forester in charge gave us permission to move in. We lived deep in the forest for five years. We had no work and hardly ever any money. They survived by foraging for food. This experience began his love for nature and was a rare mix of survival and enchantment. We were totally immersed in nature. Like most animals, our major concern was finding food. I didn't like picking berries because I had to move so slowly from bush to bush. I much preferred picking mushrooms when I could run at will through the damp forest, feeling the soft green moss under my bare feet. Young Heinrich collected beetles and bird eggs for his family's food supply. He became obsessed with the creatures around him. I had no playmates and never owned a toy. Yet I didn't feel deprived. Who needs toys after having seen caterpillars from up close and knowing they can turn into moths? Heinrich became fascinated with bugs and insects. When he was nine, he drew a birthday card for his father, and on the back, he wrote that he had collected 447 beetles of 135 species. When I was a child, my family called me Weisel, or Weasel, because I was always running through the forest. A lot of people might think of it as a deprived childhood. I feel just the opposite. I see people in the suburbs as being very deprived. They don't get to touch nature. I didn't really grow up in a household. I mean, I think I was more grown up in an outdoors hood. This was right after the war in Europe, and we lived in a cabin in the woods. And there were, you know, basically six people living us in the same room there for quite a, for a few years. And so we spent a lot of time outside. So I accompanied my father, who was still collecting his wasps, also searching for caterpillars because they are hosts for the wasps. So, you know, I remember chasing after all kinds of caterpillars and uh, had all this contact with nature because we were hunting for mushrooms and birds actually too. He was selling uh, bird skins and mouse skins and trapping to museums. So I got schooling just being out and outdoors. In April 1951, the Heinrich family immigrated to the United States and settled in Wilton, Maine, where he continued living by the forest in an old rundown farmhouse. 
His parents had little means to earn a living and worked to collect birds to be sold as museum specimens. Young Heinrich ran through the forest collecting birds for his father's collection. Soon his parents went off to Mexico and Africa to collect specimens. He and his sister were sent to the Goodwill boarding school for disadvantaged and homeless children. His childhood was difficult because his school gardens, quote, tortured him mercilessly for six years. The school included a forest of 3,000 acres, and he would flee into the woods where everything was familiar and peaceful. I eventually cleared about a half mile stretch on one of our forest trails, and I ran all by myself, feeling the freedom of wind on my face. Once he ran away from school with two buddies. They traveled about 50 miles during a day and a night until they became so hungry and tired enough to be willingly caught. He was small and awkward and was often mocked because of his interests with bugs and birds. Heinrich ran track and cross country in high school and by his senior year was the school's best cross country runner. After that, I was no longer derisively called nature boy. I was instead an animal. That sounded much better. In fact, it felt great. I remember my senior year, I think I won something like nine or ten uh, races in a row. So I was deemed worthy to go to higher education. <laughs> High school cross country has provided me the transition from running to racing. I had tasted the lure of the chase and I was charged. Yeah, I guess the question comes, you know, why? <clears throat> Why did I end up running as opposed to, let's say, playing football or basketball or tennis? For some reason, it just seemed more natural. It just seemed unadorned and simple, and I like simple, direct, and, uh, um, and it didn't seem like a game, you know, uh, something that I could practice at any time, any place. And so it appealed to me because I could do it all the time, wherever I was, no matter where, uh, I could always run. One of the main reasons he went to college was to run cross country. He attended the University of Maine and joined the cross country team. Knowing that he was small, he tried weightlifting, but ended up with a ruptured lumbar disc and the doctor told him not to run anymore. For his sophomore year, he had healed up and was ready to run again. That year, I flew. I was with the leaders of the pack and my spirits soared. His 1961 team was the best team east of the Mississippi in their division and he won the two mile track championship with a time of 9.24. His coach announced that Heinrich would be the team captain for the next year. Heinrich was determined to lead his cross country team to another championship and vowed to not let them down. But then his father asked him to go spend a year with him in Africa for his father's last great expedition. There was not a question that this would be a once in a lifetime experience and it was my only opportunity to be with my parents and see the life I had heard so much about. I had to go to Africa. So off he went to faraway Africa with his parents on this zoological expedition. His job for 13 months was to hunt birds and to skin and prepare them for a museum research collection. What about running? I had no reason to run, but when we were near a dirt road, I usually did run when our busy schedule allowed. I once ran barefoot, as I had seen the Africans do while winning at the Olympics, but the soles of my feet became like raw hamburger. I could not walk for about two weeks. On returning to college in 1963, Heinrich ran well, but not outstanding because he became injured when he tore some cartilage in his knee while pushing his small car down a hill to start it. But in his final race at the university, he was determined to get his name up on the field house wall as a school record holder for the two mile run. He ran his heart out on pace for the record, but an official lost count of his laps and didn't properly fire the warning gun to indicate his last lap to sprint. When he did kick hard, it was for a lap beyond two miles. He had missed the record by two tenths of a second. It would be a lasting disappointment. Heinrich graduated with a biology degree and then received a master's degree from University of Maine. He next traveled west, enrolled in UCLA, and eventually received his PhD in zoology. 
he became a world expert on bumblebees. During his studies and research during the 1960s, he raced now and then, but was more focused on his work. He didn't identify himself as a runner, even though sometimes he ran 140 miles during a week. My work with certain insects is where most of the percentage of my energy went. He ran regularly on the UCLA track, mostly quarter and half mile intervals, and formed a social running team. One of the guys on the team talked about someday racing 26.2 miles a marathon. I thought he was nuts. While corresponding with the world's premier biologist of social insects, Edward O. Wilson at Harvard University, Wilson mentioned that he was a runner too. He reviewed Heinrich's running history and declared out of the blue, you can run a sub-230 marathon. Uh, I take credit for having encouraged him to run in the Boston Marathon. I said, Bert, I'm a statistics duff on distance running. I, if I can't break records, I can analyze them. And I said, I've checked your run over, out in Berkeley, your times and so on. You've jacked it up in terms of my calculations and the statistics tables, and I think you could probably run a marathon under, uh, under 230. Heinrich was determined to prove him right. As Heinrich trained for his first marathon, his knee pain reappeared and an orthopedic surgeon advised him to stop running. Heinrich hoped that things would get better, and they did. In 1975, he ran the Boston Marathon and he finished with an impressive 2.23 in 46th place, beating Wilson's prediction. In 1979, the Scientific American sent Heinrich and another professor to Africa to research the African dung beetle, which fed on elephant dung. They published an amusing and interesting article about the beetle that would doze all day, and then after sundown, the flying beetles arrived in great humming clouds to feed on the poop. Heinrich published a book titled Bumblebee Economics. He shared stories of the industrious creatures and found many implications for mankind. The book received excellent reviews. I can't directly apply bumblebees to running, except that they have the same problems as us, like overheating and storing enzymes in muscles, but my science is helping a lot by my running. Heinrich continued to run marathons. In February 1980, Heinrich ran his lifetime personal marathon record of 2.22 at the West Valley Marathon in San Mateo, California, missing qualifying for the Olympic trials only by 40 seconds. Next, he ran in the famous 1980 Boston Marathon featuring Rosie Ruiz, who was caught cheating for the win. Rosie Ruiz won the women's division of the Boston Marathon, a grueling 26-mile race in record time. Her time was so stunning that few observers or participants believe she completed the entire course. Heinrich was caught up in a little controversy of his own. He finished in 225, which was good enough for first place masters, over 40 years old. But at first, the race officials believed he was 39 years old, not knowing that he had turned 40 two days earlier. When I saw that they were not calling me the winner, I protested to the race director. It took me about an hour to get back to my hotel and get my wallet with my driver's license. I brought it back, they checked my proof, and handed me the trophy. Even with his master's win, Heinrich was disappointed in his performance. He had been content with running marathons until he noticed that he was passing a lot of runners towards the end of his races and he knew that he could run much further. He decided to pursue longer distances. I'm so tired of the city And green grows the way to a place In the mountains that I love Around that time, he left Berkeley, moving to Burlington, Vermont, and took a position as professor of zoology at the University of Vermont. He promptly joined the Green Mountain Athletic Association and became their star runner, the fourth fastest marathoner in the state. He ran his first ultra in November 1980, a 50K race, the national championship held in Brattleboro, Vermont. He finished in third, but set the American Masters record of 3.03 in his very first 50K. 
On May 19, 1981, Heinrich suffered a serious knee injury while chopping a tree tearing his meniscus. He had surgery and in those days they opened up the knee and removed the medial meniscus. His surgeon said, quote, if you don't stop running, I'm going to have to take off your kneecap, and said that he only had a certain number of miles left on his knee. I figured I better get that mileage in now rather than frittering it away slowly to no effect. He first convalesced in his cabin in Maine watching ants for days, but a couple months later he was running again. At age 41, Heinrich did not just want to race his first 100k, he wanted to win the national championship held in October 1981. He worked up to 140 mile weeks and then tapered in September with 110 mile weeks. I did not know any other ultra runners, nor did I know of any training manuals on ultra running. I was up there in the woods all by myself, so I trained the way I thought I should. I felt I had to do long, hard runs. The big race was the AMJA, American Medical Joggers Association, 100K at Chicago, held on October 4th, 1981. Elite American ultra runners of the time flocked to this key race venue to compete each year at 50 miles, 100K, or both. The start was in between two out and back five mile loops through a park and along the Lake Michigan shoreline. Instead of going to the pre-race meeting the night before, he went down to the Lake Michigan shore to check out the start line and jog part of the course. There he met Ray Krolowicz of South Carolina for the first time. I'm Ray the K, also known as Ray Krolowicz. Or maybe I'm Ray Krolowicz, also known as Ray the K. I didn't know it then, but Krolowicz was a veteran who had already raced in more than 60 ultra marathons. I had raced in only one. The next morning at 7 a.m. in the dark, Heinrich lined up with 261 runners from 30 states. As he ran the first few miles, Krolowicz ran beside him, talking up a blue streak. I go out and I run. I train hard. I like to run fast. I want to keep, you know, so my goal is to keep running, stay healthy. Heinrich couldn't listen. He was lost in his concentration. Heinrich pushed ahead of Ray. The favorites, including Barney Klecker, the 50-mile world record holder, disappeared down the road. Heinrich concentrated on initially running 615 mile pace. Heinrich's strategy was to never speed up, never slow down, and not stop until the finish. He hit the marathon mark at 242. After each lap, Heinrich was met by his handler, Jack, who had him drink cranberry juice. He ended up drinking 1.5 gallons. Jack told him that Klecker was fading ahead. Heinrich was in second place. He hit 50 miles in 510, setting an American Masters record which stood for many years. Klecker dropped out after 50 miles, so Heinrich was in the lead continuing on to 100K and crossed the finish line in first place with a time of 638. He set an American record and World Masters record. One would think I'd have raised my hands in triumph and pranced around like a mad banshee. However, I was much too exhausted to raise even a finger, instead feeling a deep, quiet, warm glow. I felt unimaginable contentment as my heart pounded a long time from the hard finishing sprint. Heinrich thought that was the end of that. I promised myself that it would be the only ultra I would do in my life. I did eventually break the promise that I had made to myself and to my wife. The impact of that performance really got his ultra running career started and recognized. Ultra Running Magazine recognized his race as the performance of the year and crowned him ultra runner of the year. In 1983, he entered the rowdy 24-hour race on a track at Brunswick, Maine. His goal was to set the 100-mile American record. The race didn't go as expected. It was a very warm day, and I soon knew I had no chance of the record. I hadn't really planned on going 24 hours. I had planned to drop out after 100 miles. Heinrich reached 100 miles in 1429. He then set his sights on the 24-hour American record. At the end, I was only thinking about one thing, the record. I was so close, but I didn't think I was going to make it. After about 70 miles, he used a pad.
pattern of running five miles and then walking a lap. He took in juice and baby food, which could be easily swallowed. Finally, it came down to the last five miles, and Heinrich needed to run sub seven minute miles to get the record. He pushed very hard and did it, reaching 156 miles, setting an official American record that would stand for seven years. Heinrich was in ecstasy, thinking, I did it, I did it. He had been acutely aware of the possibility of failure, but said, You can't see or feel sunshine without shadows. You can't feel happiness without having felt disappointment. Heinrich concentrated on his next big race, the Sri Chinmoy 24 hour at Ottawa, Canada. He trained running about 170 miles a week before the race and used short races as training tempo runs. In May 1984, he had the race of his life in Canada and reached 100 miles in 1227, breaking the existing unofficial American record set back in 1971 by Jose Cortez of 1254. His 100 mile time was the sixth fastest 100 mile time ever in the world up to that point. His 100 mile record stood for more than two decades. During 1984, Heinrich took some time off from heavy training for several months to study bumblebees and build a new cabin in Maine near the Mount Blue State Park. In 1974, he had purchased 300 acres of overgrown farmland with an old cabin, which he started to use for his studies when he moved to Vermont. He would eventually expand his property to 600 forest acres. On August 31, 1985, Heinrich set the American track record for 100K by 12 minutes with a time of 7 hours 12 seconds at Rowdy Ultimate 24 Hour in Brunswick, Maine. A fellow runner at the race said, Heinrich made it look easy. He doesn't say much, but he has my utmost respect. The 100K record stood for 30 years until Zach Bitter beat it by 2 minutes in 2015. Hey Zach, stay on pace. Good job, Zach. Yeah. Yeah, 100 kilometers in 6:58, setting or breaking the uh, American track open record for 100 kilometers, six hours 58 minutes. In 1985, Heinrich also held the American records for 100k on road, 100 miles, and 24 hours. Clearly, he was the American best. Ultra-running historian Andy Milroy commented about Heinrich. His record as a setter of national ultra-bests was remarkable. The pity is that he had never or never took the opportunity to test himself against international competition. In 1985, Heinrich did compete internationally. He went to run Spartathlon. Athens to Sparta in Greece, 152 miles, and had a serious goal to win it. He was honored to be selected to run there, and it seemed like a dream. Many disputed that it was impossible for someone to cover the 246 kilometers running in just two days. However, in 1982, a team of English runners dared to try. The successful completion of the journey in two days proved that Herodotus was right. The news radiated round the world, and in a climate of general enthusiasm, the Spartathlon was born. His friend, Ray Krolowitz, was running also, and told Heinrich, quote, this race is made for you. You are the dark horse here. You can win it. I tried to brush the thought aside in order to relax, and I did not admit it to anyone, because to do so would seem to invite bad luck. Away they went, first running in Athens. For the first 10 miles, the pace seemed agonizingly slow, but Heinrich purposely was holding back. As the day became warm, he continually traded the lead with a Hungarian runner. They caught up with a runner from Denmark who had run 62 marathons with a best of 216. The three ran together for several miles. By mile 50, he was in second place to a runner from Yugoslavia. Things started to get hard to just keep up with the Hungarian, and he let him go ahead. He ran past vineyards where farmers rode along in donkey carts. He also ran through little villages. Children would run or ride their bicycles alongside asking if he was an American. Heinrich had a huge lead over the next runner, but once he hit the hills, British runner Patrick Mackey caught up. A huge blister developed, and Heinrich lost his appetite for food. 
He started to feel panic. I should have stopped to rest and to eat, but my ambition and pain blocked and blinded my judgment. I could not conceive of walking or sitting down. I still thought I was the best. At 80 miles, he just focused on short goals to reach the next aid station. Two more runners passed him, something that never usually happened to him after that many miles. With 70 miles to go, his legs were terribly stiff. Ray Krolovitz and others caught up and passed in the evening. Finally in the dark, he arrived at an aid station and made the hard decision to drop out of the race. Heinrich later reflected on successes and failures. Failures must be faced and almost welcomed. Failures are experiments that can be invaluable steps towards success. In 1986, Heinrich reported that he was not training a lot of miles. Lately, I've been sitting for days on end in Maine watching ravens. One day, he had observed about 15 ravens feasting noisily on a moose carcass near his cabin. It intrigued him because ravens are usually a solitary creature that flies alone. He wrote a widely read book, Ravens in the Winter. This University of Vermont biology professor is also a world-class long-distance runner. As he scampers through the woods near his Richmond home, he is always observing. Now we see the woodpecker up there. And always asking questions. In 1987, Heinrich ran the Philadelphia to Atlantic City 100K race, a race patterned after the classic London to Brighton in England. It was won by Charlie Treyer for the fourth straight year. Heinrich came in fifth with 756. In 1992, Heinrich ran again in a 100K in Washington, D.C. because he had time while he was writing a book called A Year in the Maine Woods. For training, he ran by himself on the lonely wooded roads feeling alive. He was curious how well he could run now that he was in his 50s. He hoped for the national championship, but came in seventh overall, but was first masters. After 1992, he stepped away from competitive running for many years. He was asked why. It just felt right. Yes, there are times when I am tempted to return to competitive running, but I'm tempted by many things. I'm now less of a runner than a writer and teacher. I would rather do what I'm best at. During the rest of the 1990s, Heinrich focused on his zoology career. I could still run, and did all the time, but in no way could I take basically two or more days and dollars out of my life and tight budget to do a race when I could run any time out my door into the woods and back, and all without hassle. Why race? Heinrich's love to run never left him. In 1998, at the age of 58, he was curious how fast he could run a mile. He measured one off and ran it in 520, but pulled a calf muscle and was left with a sore knee. Looking back on his running career, he was asked if he would have done anything different. His reply was, I'd have started ultras earlier in age, having more faith in myself and the ability to finish one. Heinrich did eventually race again. In 2001, he first ran Lake Waramung 50 in 728, which was a disappointment to him. His bad knee really hampered his effort, but he kept trying. That year at age 61, he ran in the main track club 50 miler at Brunswick, Maine and finished in 639, which set an American record for age 61. In 2001, Heinrich wrote a fascinating book, Racing the Antelope, What Animals Can Teach Us About Running in Life. He later released it in a paperback form, changing the title to Why We Run. Running has given me a lot of perspective. A lot of my research is related to exercise and endurance, temperature regulation, medical metabolic factors, and what kind of fuel to burn. Heinrich talked about achieving running success. The ultimate weapon of the long distance runner is the mind. When it gets painful, you have to think about the rewards ahead. You have to keep that dream in your mind. About training, he said, I never saw an antelope stretch. I would never think of riding a bike or weightlifting or stretching. It seemed ridiculous to me, total wackle. I always thought the safe thing was to let the body decide the right things to do. Instead of taking the 15 minutes it would take to stretch, I felt it was better spent running. 
In 2004, Heinrich was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He was then a professor emeritus of biology at the University of Vermont. In 2007, Heinrich was also inducted into the American Ultra Running Hall of Fame. In 2008, he opened the door of his aviary and set free all his ravens. He had studied ravens for 25 years and at one time had 42 of them. It felt good. I liked keeping them. I felt I had to look up close to see their interactions. I just decided they had told me enough. When Heinrich reached the age of 70 in 2010, he had his eyes on the age 70 plus record at Boston, but he withdrew when he realized he could only barely run eight minute miles. He was sidelined for a few years with knee injuries and arthritis, but eventually his knee improved and he was able to get back running. In 2019, at the age of 79, Baron Heinrich still lived in Vermont and in Maine and was working on his 23rd book. Heinrich reminded all of us, In, in a modern lifestyle, we, we're not runners anymore. So we are basically disconnected from what we previously had to do. But deep down, we are still all runners. And so our minds, as much as our muscles, are, are part of this running phenotype. Uh, the essential thing is to run, period. And, and to do it for a long time, consistently. And uh, then everything takes care of itself. With that, this is Davy Crockett, and this is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I hope you run fast and far, enjoy life, get outdoors, and most of all, stay safe and don't take unnecessary chances.